Hey, this is Carrie Getz again, and we are back for part two with Tony Grayson. Say hi, Tony. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> or I could say hi, Tony. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So we're talking about military transitioning into the mission critical industry. In the first part, Tony, you were kind enough to share with us some things that were just very, very different for you from military life coming into just the private sector, period. But let's talk about some of these veterans that are trying to find careers. And and this is something I'm really passionate about. I've been working with Salute for a long time on this and and not just veterans, but we also have programs for uh, spouses and children of veterans to get them get them sponsored into jobs in this industry because we realize it's difficult. You know, your resume looks different. You've been bouncing around a lot. All of those things can work against somebody in the military. So if you wanted to pick like how you ended up successfully getting into this industry and some things that some resume tips, maybe what skills would translate, how they would write some of those things up to position themselves for a job. Yeah, I think the first one is before you're getting out is LinkedIn is your friend. Um, By getting in LinkedIn, actually sharing your opinions, linking in with other like-minded people, asking questions because you're curious and you want to learn, but asking questions. Um, And I found that that LinkedIn base that you have is a great way for you to be seen as um, someone with a unique perspective, someone who can actually bring something, um, but uh, and can add a lot of value. Um, But you're also, I mean, it's, I think a lot of jobs are, it's kind of, it's happens, you know, it's it's happenstance is probably not the right word, but it's, it's kind of right place, right time kind of thing. And of course you can always apply for jobs and you go through the whole process and everything. But I, I find the best jobs are more likely happenstance. Like I read Carrie's posts on LinkedIn. That was really interesting. I have this job open. It kind of fits. Let's talk about that. Um, That's what I've kind of seen a lot of these jobs, how they kind of happen. So the first one is really kind of make sure that you are linking in and being interactive and expressing your opinion on LinkedIn, which is something that, you know, we're definitely not taught to do in the military, but I think it's incredibly important. Um, The second one is make, make sure your resume, people do speak military. Um, and so I think the, the most resumes I have a problem with are the ones that say they equate like a CEO to a CEO. Um, it just shows you that you don't know what a CEO does. And so just be honest in your resume, write down what you actually did, but make sure you put statistics on there. Like, you know, you saved X dollars because you did this, you know, just you, you have to, I mean, the, the private sector, at least in the tech sector, they want to see the data on it and what you contributed to and, and what you did and then what were the results of that kind of stuff. So, you know, spend a lot of time on, on that that resume. Unfortunately, the person reading your resume is probably going to spend about 15 seconds on it. And, and that's OK. Um, but just make sure you spend the time. No misspellings. Get, try to be succinct, get to the point, but show the why of why you did that kind of stuff. Um, and then the third one is kind of it's really getting out there through groups like iMasons or, you know, there's a bunch of other groups that are out there that, you know, kind of introduce yourself to the, to the private sector and their internships, fellow fellowships. I, you know, the, the most recent one I've, I've started kind of getting into more now and the name's going to escape me now, but it's, you know, the last six months of your active duty, you can actually go skills bridge. We can actually go and, and work with a company. I was like, oh, now, I wish someone would have advertised all this stuff when I was there. You know, get that critical feedback, get your name out there, and put, you can have some other experience on your resume that's not just, you know, I drove a submarine from point A to point B, or I, I did a reactor safety arts exam. You know, there's you can actually put some real-life experience out there and start to figure out where you want to be. And I guess the last one is don't limit yourself. I think there's a lot of safe ways to play the transition. You could easily go work for a defense contractor, and that's fine if you want to do that, but... I mean, look at me. I kind of, I kind of took what I learned in submarines, understand kind of how the cloud and platform work, and it's leveraged that outside the sector. And it, it is a little scary taking a jump that's outside of your skill set. But we know a lot more than we think we know. Um, we pick up things a lot more than we think we know. And you just got to have a belief in yourself, and you got to challenge yourself, and get out there and, and do it. Um, I think the most frustrating thing that people are going to find, though. And it's the scariest is people don't want to talk to you until 90 days before you transfer. And that is incredibly scary for you, your family and everyone else. But just recognize that and have a little faith that it will work out and you will find that kind of job. And guess what? If you find a job that you 
don't like, you're not stuck with it. You can go do something else. I mean, so it's not like you're signing up for another 20 year stint. You're signing up for a stint as long as it interests you and then you can find something else. So it's not like, you know, you're, you're, you're stuck in that job forever now. Um, and so I think all that kind of stuff would help people in the transition aspect of it. Yeah. And I think, you know, the skills bridge program is one that a lot of employers don't use, uh, utilize enough. And I, part of that is because of paperwork concerns. But I know that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has helped there to help you navigate all that, all the waters there. Infrastructure masons, there's plenty of people in there that can certainly help as well. And even for the spouse program through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, there's some access to, to really great people. And companies don't realize that's a free resource for that period of time. The idea is that you hire them at the end. But, you know, if, if all works out and everybody can say kubaya at the end of the six weeks or whatever. No, it's it, it's great. I mean, it just and it teaches that kind of experience and it teaches you if that sector is right for you, because you might sit there going, well, you know, I want to be a program manager or I want to go into business. And you actually figure out you hate it. I, how horrible is that to figure it out if you already got your job and now you're going to have to switch industries? So it's a good way to, you know, to test, you know, kind of out there and see what you actually like out there and, and a good way to learn, you know, for my part one, when I kind of talked about where everything is different, this is a good way for you to start learning how it's different and understand it and how you interact with it uh, in a safe environment. Yeah. And I think too, like the, um, you know, some of the certification programs are really, really helpful, not just to help you learn a new technology, but it kind of holds you to point to make sure that you've comprehended it. And then it gives you something at the end, which is something very valuable on a resume. But suppose that all things rise and set and everything's beautiful. And this company calls you in for an interview. What's different coming out of military for an interview versus somebody in private sector, or how do you speak about your military? You know, what, what tips can you give somebody in the, in the interview process? I mean, I think in the interview process, you really got to be honest with yourself. No one wants to hear that your biggest failure is how dedicated you are for your job. I mean, that just, I mean, it just shows like people want someone who's real. People want something who are thoughtful, who's really thought about stuff, who have made an impact. Um, so, you know, kind of, there's definitely a lot of questions out there. Um, but I think you got to think of some really honest answers to those kinds of questions. Now, depending on what kind of job, you might have to do some coding or you might have to do some engineering. I mean, I think I, you know, back when I applied for Facebook, I was actually drawing the ranking cycle of mechanical uh, and, and pulling out some other stuff on, you know, DC, their DC power distribution and having some some great discussions on power factor on that kind of stuff. So um, you just got to be ready for those kind of technical questions and be comfortable with it. And the good thing is at least, you know, I'm, for, for for wrong or for, for better for right, you know, in the nuclear navy, you get tested all the time, and you have to do those oral interviews for all your exams. So I I kind of felt like I was already a step ahead of it. But you know, just be honest with them and and do those questions. But you have to be ready for it's not one interview. Typically, I think at Facebook, I had nine or ten interviews. Um, everyone looking at something very specific, and so you know, understand what people are looking for, what they're interviewing for, you know, what their focus area is, and, and try to relate your questions to them. Um, and people know when they're getting their butt kissed and no one likes that kind of stuff. And so I think it's, you know, practice on these interviews to do a good job. And there's, there are groups out there that do do mock interviews. And I think there's more, many mock interviews you can do and get that kind of feedback um, is, is good. And so a great example is I used to say kind of all the time or some, you know, we all have these little ticks that we're blind to. And it's great to, to have that kind of stuff because kind of is not definite. So if I keep on saying kind of, you know, the, the impression I'm giving up to the interviewer is that I'm not definitive um, instead of making a definitive statement. And it's, and sometimes it's, it's, it's scary to make a definitive statement, but that's what interview wants to hear. So do those interviews, spend the time with those interviews, get that kind of feedback and, and continue to grow from. And to be honest, as many interviews you can do is great. And I, I just can't say there's, you know, there's definitely a skill set to answering those kinds of questions. So as many mock or even, you know, kind of real interviews you can have, the better you will be. And then what about the other way around? What can the military person or the military spouse do to interview the company to make sure that it's going to be a right fit? Because the environment's going to be clearly different. So what are some of those questions that they should ask and, and what are the things they should look for there? Yeah, I think it's it's kind of, you know, what does the job entail kind of on a, on a, you know, kind of a daily basis? 
what does it look like for me being successful? You know, kind of what your values are. And to me, the values are key because I want to work for a company who espouses the same values that I do, but not only espouses and lives by them. Um, and so you want to kind of make sure and, and feel them out. Because I mean, to be honest, with, during these interviews, it is you, great point, Carrie, that it is a two way thing that you're interviewing them to make sure you're a great fit because, you know, it's tough to find people and you should know your worth and your value for that. You can always say no, um, even if they offer you a job. So you want to ask those kinds of questions and, and be very, very clear on what success looks like, what your role is going to be, you know, where the company's headed in two, four or five years, even what they like about working at that company. Um, because you want that, you know, you want, you want to find that other home, which is that, you know, that's the one thing I love most about the military is, is working with like-minded people and, and, you know, you're all going to see now, you aren't going to go to see, but you're all doing one mission kind of thing. And there's some, that camaraderie, that's what you want in, in the company you're working with. So I want to ask you, what would you say is the biggest difference between a private sector team and a military unit? And then kind of how you infuse yourself in a team of people that you don't know with very different backgrounds, certainly than the military. Have you got any recommendations? That's a great question, Carrie. Um, I really do. There is a huge difference between, you know, kind of private sector teams and, and military units, because, you know, despite what we think we're diverse inside the military, we're really not. I mean, boot camp or ROTC or whatever program that you kind of come in, enter the, the military through all teaches you to think and be the same. And ultimately you might disagree with something, but you have to salute and carry on. So, you know, like as, as a leader of a team, you can always fall back. Well, it's an order, just go do it. And that is very, very different in kind of the private sector teams where you have people with incredibly diverse backgrounds, incredibly diverse experience, very much different personality types. And, you know, you got to figure out how to integrate with that team or, or lead that team and, and be successful about it. And you cannot rely on those whatever, you know, X years in the military that you learned that leadership um, because it's just very, very different. And so, you know, my biggest recommendation when when I, when someone gets out of the military is take some time before you start talking, learn your team, learn, you know, how they function, understand their personalities, because then you can better integrate with them and, and understand it. I think the people have the problem are the ones who sit there and say, well, I've done this before. This is what we should do or go do this because I'm the boss. It, it just doesn't work. And it's it's you have to understand how different it is. Um, and then, you know, in how do you infuse yourself in the team? I really think, you know, under, I can't say it enough is understand these personality types. You know, we took plenty of personality types like the Myers-Briggs in the military, but we never really paid attention to it. I really think, you know, if you're going into a team, make sure you're doing those personality types and, and doing those personality tests and understand how people's, are successful, what, you know, what makes them successful, what do they need to be successful, but also what makes them stressed and how do you, you know, how do you minimize that stress? Um, you have to understand that that kind of personality types, you know, for us, you know, what I've been used to right now is kind of the disc surveys where, you know, they have, you know, C, S, I, and D, and you can Google it and <laughs> look it up better than I can probably explain it. But to me, I use that every single day in my interactions with the current company I'm at, just because, you know, if I'm talking with a group, I'm making sure I know the C and the S's are out there. So I call on them because they're typically not going to speak up as opposed to the D's who are the directs will definitely speak up. And so you have to really kind of understand those personality types and, 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 and research that stuff and prepare yourself. It's not as easy as just walking into a meeting. Um, hopefully that kind of answered your question, but, uh, you know, happy to talk about this, uh, further and people can reach out if they, if they need anything more. Thank you. Yeah. And that, I think a lot of people, you know, I feel so bad for people that started new positions during COVID because you miss out on all that office interaction and zoom is, you know, it's a great tool or teams, whatever you happen to use, but it's not the same. It's absolutely not the same. No. And I think I probably had. Most of my discussions, you know, the water cooler talk really matters. You know, it's I see Carrie in her office. I stick my head in and say, hey, you know, what about this? And someone walks by and we have those kind of impromptu conversations. I think that kind of stuff's key, but also that kind of 
you know, that camaraderie, that team that you build in where you trust each other, it's super tough to get through a Zoom. Now, Zoom is great because it takes you two minutes to get to work and walk down. But I, you know, I travel, you know, for my current role, I'm up here in Seattle, but I travel down to Dallas as much as I possibly can to be with the team because you cannot, you can't beat that face-to-face communications. You can't beat that handshake or, you know, sharing a meal together. I mean, I've, I've got more work done, you know, at a table than I ever have sometimes looking across someone at a Zoom. Um, and so you want to really get out there and, and do that. Yeah. Plus you get the inflection too. You know, something that you really miss in the written word. You can't tell if somebody's happy about something or mad about something or indifferent, you know, in words. Yeah, exactly. And they won't know you as a person, which I think is, is critical to the team building is understanding someone as a person, getting another background um, and, and, and you know, developing that relationship because you care. Um, it's very easy to be a little cold sometimes or critical sometimes over a Zoom because especially with people you don't know really well. Um, and I, you know, that's why I just can't say enough for the in-person meetings. So if you had to pick, say, say we are on said interview and as a military person, what are three skills that you think every military person should bring up when you get the question, tell us about yourself. <laughs> and I think, I think the first one is, you know, I kind of mentioned this in part one is our ability to be airdropped into any situation, quickly pick it up and run with it. And that's just because we switch jobs and, and locations every couple of years. So I think that kind of is huge. I think, you know, also bringing up, you know, since the time we get in the military, we typically start leading almost immediately. So kind of espousing that leadership and working with, with a team to get something done. And I think, you know, kind of third really is, we are taught a lot of uh, technical detail, but we're also operate, and especially more towards mission critical under very, uh, you know, harsh conditions, under a lot of pressure, and we can get the job done. And I think those kind of values across all kind of military apply and are well sought out from this civilian force who who want that. And I, I'm a huge believer, and I'm not the only person you, know, you hire for attitude and you teach for skill. Um, we bring that positive attitude, that get it done attitude in the military and and don't hide behind it, you know, espouse it and, and, and really bring it to the forefront when you're doing the interview. And then what about, you know, from a military spouse perspective, you know, there are a lot of programs out there helping spouses and I know their resumes are kind of tough because in a lot of cases, you know, they've moved every two years. So if somebody looks at that resume, you know, it looks like this person is job hunted. So how, how would you, how do you present those kind of things in a better light? You know, I think the good companies who are in this, especially in our tech sector, they recognize that they understand that. And I think it's, you know, for the spouse to be upfront with it and own it. Like, you know, it's not my fault that I had to move four or five times or that I had this great job. And then I had this other job, you know, it's, it's not your fault. And I think the good companies will recognize that kind of stuff. But, you know, that also teaches you, you know, much like the military, I think it's, it's also, it brings value too. And like, you might've been four or five different jobs, but in every one of those jobs, you probably learned something different and you're probably in a different sector. And to me, that culmination of experience and knowledge, because we don't, from, from my perspective, and this is just me talking, you don't learn by reading stuff in a book. You learn stuff by doing stuff. You learn by, to be honest, getting punched, getting you know punched to the ground and having that grit to get back up and carry on. That's the stuff that you learn. You don't learn from your success because your success could be complete luck. You learn by failure. And so, or you learn by making mistakes. And the more that you do, the more experience you have, the more diversity that you have and that, that experience, I think you're a better person for it. So, you know, I don't think hide behind it. I think you own it and you go walk into it and you're, you should be proud of it. So let's talk for a minute about what to do when things aren't going right and some of the frustration, places you can reach out. But suppose you've done everything you're supposed to do. You go in, you have your interviews, you're kind of in that holding period where, you're not sure if you're still alive in the process or not. And, you know, maybe just because the difference in the process, what are some resources or some advice you can give vets that are trying to work through the private sector hiring and firing downsides? Yeah. I mean, I think first of all, you know, don't put your eggs in one basket, definitely apply for more than one job. Um, I think that's the expectation that people know you're going to do that kind of stuff, but it is, you know, you might just not be a right fit that, you know, there's plenty of reasons that they will choose not to hire you. And it, you know, most of them are not because that you're, they think you're incompetent. 
Um, it just might be a, you know, culture fit. It might be experience fit. It might be, you know, a whole host of things. So don't take any of that stuff personally, but you, but make sure that you're interviewing at a, more than one place, you know, definitely a couple of different places. Um, and then you're being honest with them about, you know, kind of where you stand with the other interview process, meaning that, Hey, you know, I might get an offer here soon. I'm going to have to accept it. You know, have you decided? And they expect that kind of stuff. So don't, you know, I think being open and transparent and communicating your thoughts and your feelings and asking questions is what they're used to seeing. So don't, don't sit and be idle. Don't af- be afraid that you're going to make them mad. and They're not going to hire you. They're not. You're just trying to understand the process and what it is. Cause some of these processes, I mean, I, I've been in interviews where you've waited months and months for it to get approved through the process and it's, and it's maddening and it's scary and it, it's all that stuff, but it's, it is somewhat normal. Um, but you know, the biggest thing is, you know, reach out, get on LinkedIn, ask questions, reach out to other veterans, ask questions, heck, email me, ask me questions too. I'm happy to help out with that kind of stuff um, and provide that kind of feedback. Just the big thing is don't suffer in silence. Um, don't just sit there and, and, and be worried about it, you know, reach out and, and get kind of feedback and, and kind of clarification. Yeah. And what would your advice be to HR departments that are trying to figure out how to more tap into the veteran, uh, you know, sector to get new employees? What are things they can do to make the workplace an easier transition for a veteran? What would your advice be on the employer side? And I think there's a a lot of good veteran groups out there right now, you know, um, like, you know, Gary Sneeze, uh, you know, Lee Kirby's um, salute, um, you know, there's just a lot of good ones out there. Ask those kinds of questions. They are those kind of veteran oriented business that are meant to help vets are meant to their whole business is to bridge the gap between the private sector and the military. And they'll be open and candid. They'll put you to, they'll put you in touch with with potential candidates. What might, what might make it easier for you to hire because you get that steady stream. Um, but there's also uh, things called TAPS, you know, the transition assistance programs that they do at the local bases, get out to a local base and talk to people and understand them, ask them those kinds of questions too. Um, just don't, you know, vets are a little bit different and understand that. Um, and maybe you might have to teach them a little bit. So maybe you carry a couple extra headcount for your data centers, but you give that, you know, kind of the journeyman, but you'll, I can guarantee that you'll, you'll have a much better product in the end than everyone fighting over that 20 year shift leader that, you know, is, is going to be a unicorn and it's probably going to retire soon. So, you know, we have to find new ways to get out there. We have to find new ways to incentivize people. We have to find new ways to teach them. Um, and it can't just be at, t- at the cheapest minimal, you know, pay and amount of people. Yeah, that's really critical too. Uh, and I think that goes whether you're hiring a vet or not, you have to invest in your people and do the right thing by your people. And then you don't really have to worry about turnover. And if you don't, well, then you need to budget for turnover because it's going to yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You don't invest in your people. Spend the time. Yeah. You know, I w- and I always hear this thing. Well, yeah, I'm going to invest time in a person, but they could leave. But my point to that is, well, guess what? They also could stay. And so, you know, how do you teach them? How do you help them to grow? How do they know what the next path to success is? Whatever that is. Like, you can't just have a, I'm going to come in and work on mechanical in a, in a data center and there's no path to success. No one's going to want to work at a place where they can't feel like they can grow. I mean, I shouldn't say that pejoratively. I mean, there will be some people who are quite happy to, you know, work on that, that chiller unit for years and years and years. And that's what they want to do. But some people will want that, want to be able to grow and they want that opportunity. And you got to invest in that. Um, you don't, and like I said, you don't want automatons out there. You want thinking, questioning good workers because they're all going to help your business. So we talked a good bit about transitioning and using LinkedIn and some of those things, but what about veterans that want to transition into some of the trades? I think that's one secret that goes in this industry a lot because you know, people assume you have to write code or, or something else to be in this industry. And we forget that there is, you know, without the trades, none of us would have a job because nothing would get built. No, so let's yeah. talk a little bit about the trades. No, and the trades everyone's fighting over right now too. There's not enough, uh, you name it, and whatever trade you you think about you can't find enough of them and it's big it's not only the building craze that data centers are on it's a building cave for facilities because it's completely transferable between that but there are plenty of uh, you know, kind of journeyman experiences where you kind of come and do an apprenticeship and you learn as you go um and and do that kind of stuff but i and i think people kind of you know they don't i mean it's just they're highly competitive to get in they, they make great money 
Um, and I don't know why people just kind of, they don't look towards there. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it seems very, very silly, but I also think, you know, we're not doing a very good job of advertising it. You know, we're, we're doing a horrible effect. I would say we're probably doing a horrible job of advertising those kind of trade experiences and what you can do and what you can get out of it and kind of what they can expect. Um, and so I think we, you know, kind of maybe marry up more with the local unions and trades to get that advertising out to the military transition. So they know that it's an option. Um, and, and I think it's a great option. And then for the TAP officers specifically, because I know I've called on a bunch of them. And a lot of what I get from the TAPs are like, well, we can put the information out there, but we have no idea how to communicate this or what this even means to people. What, I mean, outside of obviously these podcasts and other podcasts, what are, where's, you know, some advice there for the TAP officers to help them understand what the opportunities are here? reach out to the communities and bring people in, you know, you can go and speak, anyone can go and speak a tap from the industry. You just can't advertise. Like I'm hiring 10 people. If you want to, uh, you know, kind of come in here and you get this at the timeline, you have to kind of, kind of come into the industry, talk about your industry, talk about how it could be relevant to vets that are out there um, and, and kind of what they can expect to bring in. So, you know, I think it's, it's well worth getting out there and, and, and reach out to the technical center and, and they'll be more than happy to show up to the tap class and speak, you know, and, and make it incredibly relevant. You know, the one I went to, I just felt like, um, I, I, I felt like it was a check in the box. I really did. And it's not, I think they're trying hard to do it, but it's, you know, what do you want out of tap? You want to know what's out there. Uh, you know, you want to want resume, right. And you want your questions kind of answered. You want to kind of know how to do this transition. And it just seemed more like a, a check in the box and, and didn't really, you know, do anything for me to be perfectly honest. Now that was my experience. I'm sure there's been some great experiences out there, but I think it's, we need to invest in it both from the veteran side and, and the military side, but also from the, the private sector side of, of how we can enable that. Cause that's how we're going to get the, the throughput too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're about out of time for this one too. So you have any closing thoughts here? Uh, no, I just appreciate the time. And, you know, I, I think, you know, for the military out there, I think we we forget where we came from sometimes. And I think we are so wrapped up in our day to day that we forget of all the transitioning sailors and soldiers that are out there. And so I think we need to be more disruptive. We need to kind of reach out to them and we need to you know put ourselves out there to see, you know, to, to, to make an impact on these on these people that are out there. I mean, I think it's, it's critically important that, you know, they serve for, you know, even if it's for four years, probably, you know, some people are on food stamps because the pay is so bad, but they do it anyway. And we need to give back to them, especially for people who've made that transition and have a lot of advice. Like I, the more advice I can give, the more, uh, you know, skin knees falling down, <laughs> you know, get punched in the face that they can avoid. I would gladly have them learn my lessons so they don't have to learn some of the stuff that I did the hard way. Um, but, you know, for the vets, get out there and do it. Be proactive. Don't just sit on your butt. Perfect. Perfect. Well, for all for you, Tony, and for all the vets listening, thank you all so very much for your service. Thanks for this information. Turns out we need to do another one. We'll look at doing another one soon. <laughs> Thanks again, Tony. Thank you. thank you, Carrie. Thanks, Compass, too, for your time. Bye. Bye.